Amen. So keep your place there in 1 Corinthians, and we'll get there in a few minutes. But uh, first of all, let me give you a little bit of an introduction on what we're going to talk about um, this morning. So we're going to talk about something this morning that I've been thinking about for the last uh, several weeks. You know, I, I don't know. Um, I was looking into some social media things, which is kind of where the, what kind of brought this idea up in my mind. But that's not where it's the idea of the sermon is really much bigger than that. So this idea that I want to talk about this morning, uh, maybe you're not familiar with its name, but I know that you've been affected by it uh, before. I know it's something that affects us every day and, you know, that we're dealing with in our world that you're probably dealing with in your life. But it's, this, it's an idea that is something that we can fall into and it's something that we should stay far away from. So that's why um, I think it's deserving of a sermon. And the idea that I want to talk to you about this morning is this idea of something called groupthink. Okay, so I want to talk to you about groupthink this morning. So, I mean, basically, let me define it for you uh, before we even get into the sermon. But just think about this, you know, the idea of even the word, groupthink. You know, is thinking in groups better? You know, is thinking as a group better? So what is groupthink? It's an actual thing. It's a definition. Um, the, the definition of groupthink was come up with, I think, in the early 70s. But basically, let me just read for you a couple definitions of groupthink, and then we'll talk about it, and then we'll talk about what the Bible has to say about it. So groupthink, what is it? Groupthink is a psychological phenomenon in which people strive for consensus within a group. In many cases, people will set aside their own personal beliefs or adopt the opinion of the rest of the group. The term was first used in 1972 by social psychologist Irvin Janis. Uh, another definition from psychology today on groupthink says this, groupthink is a, is a phenomenon. So a phenomenon meaning it's something that just happens. When there's a certain, um, basically when there's a certain condition, when there's certain um, characteristics or there's certain conditions that are in place and there's a number of people that are under these conditions, this is something that, that happens. It comes about, this idea of groupthink. It's a phenomenon that occurs when a group of, now listen to this part here, when a group of well-intentioned people makes irrational or non-optimal decisions spurred by the urge to conform, or the belief that dissent is impossible. Does this sound like something that's good, something that we would want? The problematic or premature consensus that a characteristic of groupthink may be fueled, the problematic or premature consensus that is characteristic of groupthink may be fueled by a particular agenda or it may be due to, uh, due to group members valuing, now listen to this, valuing harmony and coherence above critical thought. Okay, so it's a bunch of people that maybe they may have an agenda. They may have an agenda they're trying to push on people, and so they're trying to, you know, achieve harmony and coherence above what was above what? Above critical thought. Now what is critical thought? So basically groupthink is kind of antithetical to this thing called critical thought. So basically critical thought is where you analyze facts to form a judgment on something. A great example of the lack of critical thought was yesterday out soul winning. I was soul winning with Brother Francisco and Brother Frank yesterday. And the first three houses that we knocked on, it was, it was this type of person. And if you've been soul winning, you know these type of people. You ask them, hey, how do you know, you know, if you died today, you know, do you, are you 100% sure that you would go to heaven? And they say, oh, yes, I'm sure. Well, what gives you that assurance? And they say, well, um, you know, what do you think it takes to get to heaven? Well, you have to be a good person. You have to go to church. You have to do all these things. You have to be, you know, do good works in your life. Follow the Bible. I mean, name whatever. You've heard it all a million times. And then you say, then you say to them, actually, you know, the Bible says something a little bit different. The Bible says that salvation is a gift. The Bible says that, it, you know, while those are good things to do, to go to church, to ask for forgiveness, whatever they said, you know, the Bible says that actually has nothing to do with salvation. That it's a free gift that you don't, it's not of works. Oh yeah, 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 exactly. See, that is a person who's not capable of critical thought. Or maybe they're not, it's not that they're not capable, if they're, not, they're not exercising critical thought in their life. Because they hold, they hold a belief that is, that they're contradicting themselves in their own statements and in their own beliefs. So they are unable to have 
you know, this, they're, they're not good at critical thinking. Okay, so look, groupthink is important. Groupthink is affecting people. This is somebody who's likely fallen into groupthink, and they're, it's not that they're not capable of critical thought. It's kind of like a muscle that you, you, know, you just haven't exercised in a long time. They're, just, they're not critically thinking because they have an irrational, they have an illogical belief system where they believe things, they, they just told you they believe two things that cannot be believed at the same time. So they're not able to critically think. So look, social media, which is why kind of what brought this up in my mind, it tends towards groupthink. Social media tends towards groupthink. Why? Why does it? Because the platforms themselves, first of all, are pushing for groupthink. The social media platforms are pushing for it, and not only are they pushing for it, but they're engineering it. They're engineering groupthink. Groupthink gets people to set aside. What, remember those, those statements that I just read to you? It gets people to set aside their own personal beliefs. You know, social media platforms today, look, they're, they're not only getting you to set aside your own personal beliefs, they're setting those aside for you. They're filtering the message that you see when you're on these social media sites. So they're creating it, they're creating what you see. They're engineering what you see for you. The platform itself is engineered groupthink, many of these social engineering platforms. They're, they're getting people, you know, they're, they're filtering personal beliefs out, is what they're doing. Okay, you know, free speech is going away, by the way. I don't know if you noticed. Okay, censorship is, is here, front and center, but it's not just censorship is what I'm trying to get across to you. It's a framing. It's a framing. You know, framing the world, by the way, that's a brilliant name. That framing the world is, is, is I mean, it's a brilliant name. You know, so that's what everyone's trying to do. That's what social media is doing today. They are framing a, a worldview for you. They're showing it. They're, they're engineering what they want you to see. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 8. Look, it's also what we're trying to do. We are trying to frame a worldview. We are trying to frame a worldview. I think I have the wrong chapter here. <laughs> I'm sorry. Hang on. One second. First Corinthians chapter. Uh, no, this is not correct. Um, I'm just going to read the verses for you. I'm not sure what I labeled wrong here. But the Bible says here, it says, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor that, whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore, we're trying to frame a worldview here as well. How do I know? Because this verse right here. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciousness. Look, we are trying to do the same thing. We are trying to persuade people of our worldview. We are trying to frame a worldview. Look, we are trying to persuade people of the Bible. That's what the Bible says we're doing. We're trying to persuade people of the truth. And other people are doing the same thing. They're trying to persuade people of their view and stop the persuasion of the truth. So look, groupthink is a part of this. It's a method that they're using for this. Okay, now look, let me just say this note before we get into the sermon, but this is all just for purpose of introduction. This is not to be confused with collaborative thinking. Okay, collaborative thinking... Look, collaborative thinking under, you know, collaborative thinking is where I'm a leader and then I take the opinions of those in my group and I, you know, I, I choose the good ones and I, I, I don't choose the bad ones, okay? Now, collaborative thinking, if done under proper leadership, if done under wise leadership, is extremely powerful, okay? It's extremely powerful. As a leader, you should use collaborative leadership. However, Collaborative, collaborative think, collaborative, the idea of collaboration under poor leadership can lead to groupthink. Yeah. Under dictatorial, 
uh, leadership can lead to groupthink. Look, I mean, when you're in, in uh, are you saying, you know, I lead my family, men? You're saying, I should collaborate with my family? Yes. You should collaborate with your wife. You should listen to your wife. And look, you are in charge, but you should take you know, the opinions of people in your family. You should collaborate with the people in your family and be a wise leader to be able to choose the good and maybe not take the advice in the, in the bad directions. Okay, But look, it's, it's not groupthink, so that's not what I'm talking about. But poor leadership can lead to groupthink, even in collaborative environments. Okay, so now, you know, I mean, think about this in a work environment. Think about, um, this is an example of poor leadership turning collaboration into groupthink, okay? Think about a boss who's just a, a dictator, and everyone's afraid of him, and he just, he makes these goals, and they're impossible goals. They're just, they, it can't be done. But everyone's so afraid to say, hey, you know, we're not going to be able to meet that goal or whatever, and you just end up with all these people who are just yes men, who just tell the boss whatever he wants to hear, and you end up with an entire organization moving in a direction that's an impossible direction. I mean, this is how, how like, Enron happened. I mean, they've studied Enron and, and like, you know, horrible foreign policy decisions in the 60s and 70s, and they're like, it was because of groupthink. It was because everybody was a bunch of yes men and they were just following you know, this group mentality. Nobody wanted to offend anybody. Nobody wanted to say that wasn't going to work. Nobody said, you know, hey, that's a bad idea. Nobody wanted, they all wanted harmony. They all wanted peace. And so we end up in you know, stupid situations, horrible situations. I mean, it's, it can destroy organizations. It can destroy nations, this idea. Okay. So what does the Bible say and what does this have to do with the Bible? Okay, now, we have the idea of groupthink, right? It's this idea that you're just going to set aside your personal beliefs, you're going to set aside anything that might be divisive, anything that could offend, anything like this, and we're just going to go with, with peace and harmony. Nobody has any independent ideas that might go against the group, and we're just all going to get along. That's groupthink. What does the Bible say? Turn to Luke chapter 12. Enter Jesus. Enter Jesus. Here's the opposite of groupthink. Like I said, it's not just a little bit different, it's completely op opposite. Look at Luke chapter 12 and verse number 51. Luke chapter 12 and verse number 51. The Bible says, Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth. I tell you nay, but rather division. Well, that doesn't sound uh, very groupthinky. For from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two, and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son, the son against the father, the mother against the daughter, the daughter against the mother, the mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. So let's go back to our definition of groupthink. Groupthink is a psychological phenomenon in which people strive for consensus within a group. Jesus here is saying that he brings division to a group. So groupthink is trying to get consensus amongst a group. Now, what's the tightest group you could think of? It would be a, a family unit, a father and a son, a daughter. I mean, they're, they're married. I mean, they're, they're, they're son-in-law, they're daughter-in-law. I mean, this is a tight group. And Jesus is saying, we're going to divide that group. This is the opposite of groupthink, folks. Groupthink is trying to bring these groups together. It's trying to get these groups together together for harmony and coherence above critical thought. These are people striving for peace. People, I mean, you, I mean the fun, here's the funny thing. Turn to Jan Daniel chapter 9. You say peace. Well, I mean, who could argue against peace? I mean, why in the world? I mean, peace is good no matter what. Peace, peace is, I mean, peace is good no matter what. I mean, you say peace. I mean, look, I get up today and I say peace. And the, whatever I say after that is must be true. That's where people are at today. I mean, it's, I'm talking about, hey, peace, blah, 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 blah. And I must be true, whatever I just said. But look, turn to Matthew or uh, Daniel chapter 9. Here's somebody that's going to be striving for peace. Here's somebody that's going to be claiming peace. Here's somebody that's going to be bringing peace. Look at Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince shall come to destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be a flood, 
and unto the end the war, the war desolations are determined. He says this is talking about a prophecy of Daniel's 70th week, Daniel's 70 weeks. We've gone through that in detail. I'm not going to preach that again this morning. But this is talking about the Antichrist right here. And the Bible says in verse 27, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. This is the 70th week. And in the midst of the week shall he cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation that determined shall be poured up, poured upon the desolate. This is talking about how the Antichrist is going to bring peace. He's going to bring peace. It's going to be this guy that's going to be like, he's going to solve all these problems and bring all this peace right before he kills everybody, by the way. Okay? So, I mean, be careful about this word peace being thrown around because Jesus never claimed to bring peace. Jesus never claimed that that was his, you know, back in, you know, Daniel chapter 8, you know, it was talking about empires, you know, it's talking about empires in these prophecies, they destroyed through peace. They destroyed through peace. Turn to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Look at Matthew chapter 10 and verse number 34. Here's Jesus talking about peace. Jesus, Jesus came to earth. And Jesus, the, the, the loving Jesus that loves everybody no matter what and just loves everything and loves everybody's thoughts and loves all this stuff. What Bible are you reading? The, the Jesus that's got you know, the sheep and all this stuff. You know, look at Daniel, or, uh, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 34. It says, Think that I am come to send peace on earth? You think Jesus came and said, I, everybody's going to get along now. Now look what he said. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Kind of sounds like the opposite of peace to me. Amen. Jesus said, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. So how does this apply? So we see that you know, there's a lot of opposites from groupthink to what Jesus actually said. Let's look at this idea of the church itself. Look at, go to Matthew chapter 16. You're already in Matthew. Go to Matthew chapter 16 in verse 18. Let's look at this idea of groupthink as it, as it applies to our church here. Let's look at that. Because, I mean, look, I mean, Jesus said, Jesus said in Matthew 16 verse 18, he said this. I mean, it's interesting how far away this mentality of groupthink is from the structure that the church is actually supposed to be um, run under. Look at Matthew 16, 18. Jesus said, And I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates... But then he gives a promise. And he says, And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So this verse, what this verse tells me, what this verse tells me is that if we follow the biblical model for a church, nothing can stop us. That's what this verse says. That's, if you're, if you're going to take away something from this verse, that's what the takeaway is. The takeaway is, hey, if, if it's my church, if it's Jesus' church, if there's a candlestick here, and we run this like the Bible says that we're supposed to run this church, nothing can stop us. That's what this says. The gates of hell, the, the, the demons, the Satan himself cannot stop what's going to happen here, what we're going to do here. If, if we follow what we're supposed to do. If we follow the model. Turn to Revelation chapter 4. That's why, that's why you will never see anything even close to hinting about denominations in the Bible. There's no mention of it. There's no mention of it. Look at Revelation chapter 4 and verse number 4. So what is the model of the church? Of churches? I mean, that's, well, that's, I just gave it away. First of all, I mean, it's church as. You never hear anything about the universal church. You know, the church on earth. Any of this type of thing. You hear the church as. When Jesus is writing in uh, Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 4, when He's talking to the church, He's not talking to the church. He's talking to the specific churches. Look at, look at verse 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from which from Him which is, and which was, which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before His throne. He doesn't mention, you know, to the church in Asia. He doesn't say, you know, in any kind of universal lang language. Okay? There's no universal church in the Bible. It is individual churches. There's no denominations. There's no mention of it. See, the problem is, 
You know, there's no mention of these presidents or vice presidents or cardinals or popes or CEOs. There's no mention of that type of structure when it comes to my church, Jesus says. There's no mention of that. Now, of course, every denomination claims to be the true church, but there's no mention of denominations in, in the first place. You know, so what is the point of, what is the doctrine of a denomination? What are they trying to do? What are they trying to do? What they're trying to do is they're trying to put people into a group. That's what they're doing. And that's why it's not according to the biblical model. They're trying to put you in a group. Why? So they can control the way that you think. That's why. They're going to put you in a group so you think like a group. Group think. Denominations are an example of group think. Pastors in a denomination, they must toe the line. Or they can't be part of the denomination. They must follow the rules. They must set aside those personal convictions. The problem with this is not only is it, uh, you know, it's not the biblical model, we see that, but we see that, you know, the, the problematic or the pragmatic problem is that corruption spreads faster, farther, and it's more thorough to corrupt. And of course, the denomination will say, we follow a Bible doctrine. You know, some, some um, don't even claim that, by the way. I think there's a lot of denominations today that don't even claim to follow the Bible. They have gotten away from even saying that the Bible is the infallible Word of God. They don't even believe the Bible anymore. But if a denomination goes bad, many churches follow it. That's the problem. It's, it's spiritualized groupthink is what the denomination system is. And here's another thing. It creates... and So basically, the denomination is groupthink spiritualized. That's what it is. And that's why we see every, you know, all these denominations, and they're all corrupt, every single one of them. But the second thing is this. It actually creates an unbiblical structure of power outside the individual church. It creates this structure of power outside the biblical model for the individual church. So, I mean, you have the individual church, and then you have this power structure above it. And here's the problem with ladders, folks. People will climb them. I mean, wherever you put in place ladders, people are going to be striving to climb those ladders. That's where you get your CEOs, your CFOs, your COOs, your VPs. I'm not talking about business organizations. I'm talking about churches. I'm talking about church denominations. Look, it's all fine for secular organizations, but it's not to be found in the biblical church. It's not, it's not in here. So what is the structure inside the church? Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. What is the structure inside the biblical church? Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Look at verse number 22. The Bible says this. It says, Wives, submit yourself unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And He is the Savior of the body. Therefore, and again, as the church is subject unto Christ, I mean, it pretty much bypasses every single rung in all of these ladders now. I mean, the church is subject to Christ. There is no Pope, CEO, President, Vice President, none of that. The church is subject to Christ. That's it. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, let also the wise be subject unto their own husbands in everything. Look down at verse number 30. For we are members of His body, of His flesh, of His bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning, again, Christ and the church. So we see he's comparing the church and Christ to the same model for a family. I mean, it'd be like, you know, it'd be like there was a bunch of It'd be like there was a bunch of levels in between a husband and his wife. It, it, was, it would be like if, you know, a husband, yeah, he was in charge of his family, but there's a whole bunch of, like, uh, vice presidents and, you know, CEOs and, pre, you know, all these, you know, before, you know, his wife came into the picture. I mean, it's, it's stupid when you think about it that way. But that's the model. 
That's the model. It's, it's the church is subject to Christ. That's it. Pretty complicated. Let's pray. No, we're not done. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. That's the structure for the church. That's who the church is subject to. Now, let's look inside the church. So we see the church. We see the church. I need a whiteboard. We see the church, and it's subject to Christ. But now let's look inside the church itself. Now we're in an individual church. We're not in a denomination. It's just the church to Christ. That's it. That's the model. But now let's look inside the church. What is that model? You say, this is getting complicated. It's really not that complicated. It's pretty simple. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, The elders which are among you I exhort. The Bible uses elders, pastors, and bishops interchangeably. So he's talking about pastors which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. And then it, it tell, So it's basically saying that there's this position inside the church. Okay, It's this position of an elder or a pastor. Or it also calls it a bishop. In verse number 2, it tells you the, the job of this person. Peter is exhorting these leaders, exhorting these, these church leaders, these pastors. And he says, here's your job. In verse 2, he says, feed the flock of God which is among you. Taking the oversight thereof. It's like you, you are in charge. Lead that flock of God. Not by constraint, but willingly. Whoa! That's where, everybody, you know, we just lost a bunch of pastors right there. Not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither as being, again, lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, so you're kind of like this shepherd, pastor. You're, you're a shepherd, but there's a chief shepherd coming. You shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. But look, so there's these, there's these guys... And we, I'm not going to get into the qualifications of these men, but I mean, the Bible's very specific on who can be one of these elders, pastors, or bishops. Same thing. And who's qualified and who's not. And what their job is. Their job is right here. It's to feed the flock of God. Not by, but it can't be by force or threat. Most problems that you see within a church leadership is, or a lot of them that comes from the pastor anyway, is because of this. It's the pastor who feels like he's losing grip. So I'm going to threaten to take away your salvation today. Listen to me, if you don't come to church, I'm going to take away your salvation. You know, these people that sat in church for 20 years, they sat in church for 20 years, and they, they stood up in church one day, and they're like, oh, oh, I don't even think I was saved. They sat in a Baptist church for 20 years, they had the right gospel, and they stand up, and they say, oh, oh I just got saved five seconds ago. They're in a church where their pastor is threatening their salvation constantly. That's, right. That's the answer to that. You're like, how could that happen? How could somebody... It, it didn't happen. They're just threatened. They're threatened. They're, they're, they're trained to doubt their own salvation. So it's a, it's a pastor that can't control or, you know, is losing control of his, you know, or thinks he has to control or whatever. It's a control tactic. That's it. Okay, look, you don't come to church here. Yeah, that's that, you know, I hope you come to church. But if you don't, you know, I don't have to chastise you. <laughs> I don't know. I don't have to chastise you. I don't want to. I don't have to. Because God's going to work that out with you. That's where the, you know, it can't be by force or threat. It can't be what? It can't be uh, for filthy lucre. It can't be for money. Anybody who do this for money is insane, but I don't know. So, <laughs> but that's another thing. Okay, but look, it can't be for money, and it can't be for force or threat. So what are, I mean, look, what, what are, like, look at these, these huge religions started by men, that, these false religions. What are they after? The Mormons, all these guys? What are they after? They're after money and power. They're after money and power. So Jesus is basically saying, hey, look, the shepherds, the shepherds that are going to sit in my place until I come back, he's like, it can't be for money or power. And if you're going into it for money or power, he's like, no, it can't be for that. Turn to Acts chapter 6. So there's more. There's, there's more than just the pastor. Look at Acts chapter 6. In Acts chapter 6, we see another office that is, that is put into the church. Look at Acts chapter 6 and verse number 1. And we see the purpose of this office. In Acts chapter 6, look at verse number 1. So we see that somebody has the oversight of the church. A pastor has the oversight of the church. He's there to feed the flock of God. He's there to, you know, willingly. Look, if you don't want to be here, why would you be here? That's why I've said so many times these people that just complain about their church constantly, it's the dumbest thing in the world. I mean, why in the world would you go to a church where you just complain about it? You just, you know, no one's forcing you to be here. No one's forcing you to come here. I'm not forcing you to come here. 
and I'm never going to force you to come here. But look, I'm, I'm trying to feed the flock of God here. Look at Acts chapter 6 and verse number 1. What's the next office? And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So here we have somebody in the church, people aren't, aren't being taken care of. And the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the ghost, Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. So here they pick these, these men to become the first deacons of the church. And they're there to help, because Peter is basically saying, he's saying, hey, you know, should we just leave? Should we leave preaching the gospel and go and just make sure, you know, all these people are taken care of? He's like, no, we're going we're gonna to delegate that out. So the deacon is there to handle, you know, the day-to-day -day things so, you know, the pastor or the main shepherd can be preaching the word, can be, you know, doing the main thing of the church. So look, that's, I mean, that's the whole structure. Pretty complicated, all right? It's pastor-led deacons for support. That's it. That's the biblical model for the church. And the church is subject to who? It's not subject to a president or a CEO or somebody somewhere else. It's subject to Christ. That's it. It's very simple. Then there's all kinds of qualifications for the pastor, qualifications for the deacons. There's, I mean, there's all these things that must be met, but the pastor is subject to Christ. That's who he's subject to. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 23. Now look. He's not subject to a president, a pope, a CEO, or whatever. You're saying, okay, he's subject to nobody. No, he's subject to Christ. He's subject to Christ. So, will every pastor be good? Will every pastor do his job well? No. So what's going to happen then? What's going to happen if you get this pastor who's in charge of a church and he just starts doing all the wrong things? He just starts, you know, preaching wrong stuff, bringing bad people in, letting bad people in, whatever. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 23. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 23. Look at verse number 1. This is something that, you know, if you're going to go into the ministry, you probably should memorize this one. Jeremiah 23, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, against the pastors that feed my people, ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. So first of all, there's two things here. Okay, The first thing is, if a pastor doesn't do what he's supposed to do, this is a warning that God is going to just visit evil. God's going to hurt them. That's what that means. When God says, I'm going to do evil, that doesn't mean God is like on Satan's side. That means, you know, God's going to hurt them. He's going to punish them. So a pastor that's not doing what he's doing, well, he scattered the flock of God. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. How did he scatter the flock? Well, here's the thing. We're not for groupthink here. Every man the, man, the head of every man is Christ, right? Guess who the head of you is? Christ. So you should know the Word of God. You should know the Bible. And guess what? If you end up in a church, you end up in a church where the Bible's not being followed and the pastor is doing something against, if we have a bunch of independent thinkers that know the Bible and follow Christ, that church should be empty really fast. But you get a bunch of group think. A bunch of people are just, uh, whatever you say. And they don't know the Bible. The head of them is a man and not Christ. That's how you end up with, you know, massive groups of people heading in the wrong direction because they're not independent thinkers. They're just following this groupthink mentality. Okay? Look, so, look, that's how the church should be scattered. It's another, you, did you know that you sitting in the pews, in the chairs, are another protection for the church? That you knowing the Word of God is a protection for the church. Because if you sit in many of this, I mean, many times this has happened to many of you. I know it. Where you sat in a church and the wrong things were being preached. You sat in a church and, you know, false doctrine was being preached. And what did you do? You're not there anymore. You're not there anymore. Because you're not a, you're not a groupthink mentality. You don't have a groupthink mentality. But even if that does happen, even if that does happen, a pastor goes bad into false doctrine and a bunch of people stay with him and go bad 
and you know the candlestick is removed, as Jesus said that he will do. Look, that's, then it's just one church that goes down. That, that's another beauty of the model of the independent church. It's just one church. So it doesn't take down multiple different churches if one man loses his mind or is a wolf and ends up convincing people to let him whatever, you know, take over a church and all this type of thing. It's just one church. And then the individual thinkers in that church can, can you know, think with their feet, basically. Okay? So look, in conclusion, what I'm trying to get you to understand, and this kind of, let me just wrap it up in, in this statement. For the gospel, independent thought must thrive for the gospel to succeed. Think about that. Independent thought must thrive for the gospel to succeed. And I want to explain this to you. Why? You say, you say look at all these false religions out there today. You know, all these terrible philosophies, all these wicked ideas. Look, I'm telling you, when you see all this, when you, you're sitting here and you're like driving by all the churches, and you're like, 95, 95% of all churches are false gospel. Why? It's so depressing. It's, no, it must exist. It must exist. Why? Why must it exist? Don't be discouraged. They have to exist, because if only one is chosen, if only one religion or idea or philosophy is chosen, it will never be the truth. That's why they must exist. Turn to Luke chapter 13. You say, that's interesting, you just made that up. No, I'm gonna, I'll show you from the Bible. Look at Luke chapter 13 and verse number 23. Look, when Jesus comes back, he's going to fix it all. But during this time, it all must exist. Don't let that discourage you. It, it must exist. For the truth to be able to have even a chance, it must exist. And here's why. Look at Luke 13, verse 23. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. In Matthew 7, he says, Straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. Broad is the way that leadeth unto destruction. They asked, are there few that be saved? And you know what Jesus said? He said, yes. Amen. We are always going to be the minority out here. Right. Always. The gospel, the true word of God, is never going to be the majority opinion. Right. Why? Turn to Acts 7. Let's look at one of the deacons. One of my favorite chapters in the entire Bible. Acts chapter 7. I mean, think about this. Stephen preaches a sermon. He basically recaps the entire Bible in his sermon and then preaches the Gospel right after that. I mean, it, he's filled with the Holy Ghost. The Bible says his face was like an angel. Can you imagine the speech? Can you imagine what it sounded like and what it looked like? And people, I mean, can you imagine somebody gives a sermon like that? I mean, they must have just been praised. They must have been praised. And they, can you believe it? And people must have just got down on their knees crying and getting saved. Look what happened. Look at verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. And they gnashed on him with their feet, with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly unto heaven, into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Jesus stood up for him. So Jesus recognized it, but they killed him for it. Look, the gospel is never going to be the popular opinion. It cuts to the heart. It's no different for us than it is in Jesus' day. It's the same thing. The best we can hope for until Jesus comes back is for independent thinking to thrive. Because it protects the church and it protects the gospel. Look, folks, I'm fine with competing in a free market of ideas. I'm fine. 
because we've got the best idea. I mean, it's like we're out there selling Ferraris and everybody else is pitching bicycles. I mean, but the thing is, if, if we go into groupthink, it's never going to be the Ferrari that's chosen. It's going to be one of the bikes. It's going to be a used, rusted bike. It doesn't even work. So I'm fine. Hey, I'm fine being out there. I mean, how many times have you been soul winning and, and you're out there and you're talking to one of these people that they, they're all wrapped up and mixed up and you're giving them the gospel and they're like, that just makes so much sense. Amen. Like, that's so simple. Like, wow, I've never heard anyone, I've never heard it explained like this before. Amen. What are we doing? Do we make up some weird thing? No, we're just reading the Bible to them. Amen. That's it. You're like, there's a million different false religions. No, there's only, there's only two religions in the whole world. There's, there's works-based salvation, and there's the Bible. Amen. That's it. So I'm fine, because we got the best idea. Amen. We have the idea. Look, there's only one idea where you can believe it, and the entire Bible will make sense. If you believe these other bicycles or these other ideas, you can't even read the Bible, because you're like, oh, that, that sounds weird. That doesn't sound like it goes with my idea. Not of works. I mean, I mean that's complicated, right? That's a complicated phrase. Not of works. I mean, can you imagine believing works and then reading, you know, Ephesians 2? I mean, what would you even think? You're like, oh man, I better just stop reading the Bible and just listen to, you know, Padre or whatever. <laughs> you know? I mean, that, but that's why they don't read the Bible. Because it doesn't make any sense. Because it's a, it's a, they, they, they're not gonna, if they critically think, the Bible doesn't make sense to what they believe. So we have the best idea. It will never be the idea that's chosen, though. So until Jesus comes back, just be happy that we have independent thinkers out there. Because we have, I mean, we, we have the best thing. It, Jesus, and look, Jesus knew this when he said that we persuade men. He's like, you're going to persuade men. Meaning, you're going to go out there. I'm giving you, look, he's like, I'm giving you the Ferrari. I'm giving you the Ferrari. It's shiny. It's new. People are going to love it. It makes sense. It's simple. It's perfect. It makes sense of everything. It makes sense of everything in the world. It unwraps all people's, you know, conflicting beliefs that they hold within themselves. But he's like, it's going to be easy to persuade men, but you have to persuade them. Because it's never going to be the one that the government of Russia picks, or the government of the United States picks, or the government, these governments that picked a state religion, you know, not that we picked a state religion, but it's good that we didn't, is what I'm saying, because we never would have picked the right one. We never would have picked the right one. So look, may, I just want to help you make sense of why these outside ideas exist. And, and it's, you know, we won't, and here's another thing. Here's another thing. You're not going to persuade everyone. You know, I mean, that's why it says, you know, narrow, straight. Straight meaning like the Strait of Hormuz. Like a, it's a narrow pathway. Like straight, straight meaning not many people are going to get through it. The opposite of broad. You're not going to persuade everybody. Look, don't let that destroy you. I mean, belief, I mean, look, or look, if you let that destroy you, you know what you're pushing? You're pushing groupthink. If you're like, everybody must believe just like me. No, they're not going to believe just like you. It's not going to happen. I wish it would, but it's not. You know why? Because belief is a personal thing. Because belief is the only thing that that person or that other person, it's totally theirs. You can't force it. You can't force it. So just remember, you know, don't let... It's, it's the narrow way. It's the straight way. And look, we're out there, and we're trying to get every single, we're trying to ram every single soul through that straight gate. I mean, we're trying to just, just ram as many through as we possibly can. But not everybody's going to believe. Not everybody is going to accept the truth. That's it. You know, and look, it, it's... I used to get, when I was in my like, mid-20s, when I was in my 20s, probably, my wife probably, maybe it's longer, I don't know, I used to get really upset when people didn't agree with me. I want to fight a guy over abortion one time. We're at dinner with a bunch of people, and I'm arguing this guy's pro-choice, and I'm like, how about we just go out in the back and work it out? <laughs> everybody, in the, everybody at the dinner table like, ah. And I wasn't joking. 
But I mean, I used to get really upset when people didn't see things my way. I'm like, you murderer, I'm gonna take you out back and show you a few things. Look, that's not Christian, okay? It's not Christian. Not everyone's gonna see it our way. We have the best idea. Let's push those ideas. But just remember, if group think thrives, the gospel will not. Because the gospel will be, remember it's talking about getting people to compromise their ideas, to compromise their personal beliefs. The gospel itself will be the idea, the first idea that is compromised. It will be the first thing that is thrown to the side. Why? Because it divides, it offends, it cuts to the heart. You can't have a group think environment, you know, just looking for everyone to be in harmony and have somebody preaching the gospel. It's not going to work. Because it cuts to the heart. They killed Stephen for it. They killed Stephen for it. It divides people. That's what it does. Social media, the, I, the thing that, that popped this into my head, it is a tool for putting people in boxes, is what it is. Don't be put in a box. Don't be labeled. Your independent thinking, it will protect you, and it'll, it'll protect this church. And it will, I mean, it will serve you in your life. This independent thinking will serve you in your life, in your family life, in your work life. I mean, it'll protect your church. Today there are powerful forces at, at work, folks, to, in social media, in the media itself, it, you know, they're trying, they're trying to shut down individual independent thought in the, name, in the name of peace. In the name of peace. In the name of peace, they cause violence. Open your eyes on what's actually happening. In the name of peace, they cause violence. That's what the Antichrist will do. In the name of peace, he will cause violence. In the name of inclusion, they exclude. In the name, in the name, this is my favorite one. In the name of, in the name of tolerance, they're intolerant. In the name of harmony, they oppress the truth. They don't want to hear the truth. They are framing the world that you want to see, that they want you to see. Don't be put in a box because where group think, where group think thrives, the gospel dies. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.